Um, I'm Tracy Mendez. I'm the executive director at CSHA. And among the many things that I'm grateful for is um, the opportunity to really inherit this annual conference, which is such a special event for us at CSHA. And even though we miss seeing you in person, it's been um, a real privilege to see your photos, see you um, in the exhibit halls and interacting with our speakers. Um, thank you for being here. One of our partners commented on what a diverse audience it is, and um, it's really true. You know, you come from all over geographically across California and the world. Japan, I think, is our furthest attendee. Um, and you come from so many sectors, from um, public health, healthcare, education, juvenile justice, child welfare, youth development, public policy, government, and other, other areas. Um, and you're united by caring about children and youth, health, education, and wellness for young people. Um, I really want to take a special moment to thank you because I know this is a hard year and it's a hard time of year. Um, folks have commented that they're understaffed. And I really appreciate that you were able to carve time out of your busy schedules to prioritize learning and connecting and um, better supporting the young people that you work with. So glad you could do that. Um, you know, I also, um, when I see the quality of people here, it also just gives me the joy and confidence that our young people are in your hands. Um, thank you. And I also want to know, you to know that we see you. We see not just that passion, but also the struggles. We know that over the past 18 months and long before that, many, many of you have been going well beyond your official job titles and job descriptions to step up and help young people and their families that need you most. We want, we know that you went well beyond your four walls often during the most active phase of the COVID pandemic and that you probably do, continue to do so now, even when you're tired, burned out, understaffed, under-resourced, maybe scared, maybe frustrated, and probably disheartened by growing disparities in health, wealth, education, environment, and community well-being. So we know it's a challenge to maintain that spirit and optimism and commitment and momentum and your ability to be more than like just healthcare or just education for children and youth in California. And especially for low-income children, children of color, and other marginalized and under-resourced populations. So I hope that you can all think about as we go back to normal, whatever that looks like, how you can hold on to the strong sense of purpose that has guided you these past three days. How will you keep that drive without sacrificing yourself, your self-care, your boundaries, your families, your rest? And just like the kids and families that we all care about, we know you and your schools and your school-based health centers are weathering a lot of storms. I know you've all been tapping into your own resilience for these past few days and these past many months and, and years and I hope we've been able to share some strategies for bolstering this innate drive for renewal and recovery. Let us know how we can help you throughout the year. We know we can't bring Lance McGee into all of your homes or workplaces, but um, we're here. So I wanna try and tie together some of the things we've heard over the past three days. We were so blessed and fortunate to hear from these national experts, Dr. Sean Ginwright, Dr. Janine Jones, Dr. Howard Pender Hughes. Thank you to these remarkable guests for giving us their time these days, their careers, for putting their deep love and care for young people and their brilliant minds, and to putting a scientific framework and an evidence-based framework around the things that I think so many of us sense and experience in um, communities suffering from trauma and toxic stress. We want to thank them for dedicating their, their work to um, not just acknowledging and naming those processes, but also for bringing their solution-oriented thinking about how all of us working in these fields can, um, and at the intersection of these fields of health and education, for example, can do something to support healing and resilience. And how all of us in our own roles, whether that be education, you know, being a teacher, being an administrator, a coach, a school nurse, um, a nurse practitioner, a youth leader, how we can all help bolster the natural resilience of children, 
youth, families, communities, and institutions to recover and heal. How we can cultivate restoration and hope, and how none of us is the worst thing we've ever done. None of us. Even if that thing was a massive te technical snafu in the middle of a really deep and important keynote speech. So we all have the power to recover, and we all have to support this recovery for our youth, for ourselves, and for each other. Dr. Jen Wright described that in many ways, society is sitting between trauma and transformation, and that we can all help move toward transformation. In a session I was in, Jen Leland and Darren Green talked about moving from chaos to cohesion after a crisis. And then Mizan, Al-Kebulan, Abaka talked about many of these transitions, moving from isolation to connection, from harm to restoration, from othering to belonging, from fear to curiosity, and from competition to collaboration. So these past few days, we've learned how to leverage the power of bubbles, grandmamas, authentic listening, youth voice, mindfulness, intergenerational healing, and many other strategies to resource ourselves and our young people. Because, and to paraphrase Dr. Jen Wright again, we can't get to learning or health or well being for young people without also supporting health and well being for the adults that work with them, whether they be in education, healthcare, or other fields. I know that some of you are nurse practitioners or dental hygienists, and so you're obviously not going to start a restorative justice program at your school. Um, I just was listening to Colleen McAvoy, who's a nurse practitioner working in a very rural school. Um, in the Eastern Sierras. She's kind of a one person show, I think. Um, and so, you know, there might be times when it's not clear how all this fits in your daily work. But what we hope you'll take away from the principles that Dr. Jones and Dr. Pinder Hughes and others shared is you can bring this intention and this approach to your work, whatever that is. When you're doing screening, expert, um, when you're trying to help young people choose and exercise healthy behaviors for themselves, it, you can bring their cultural identity in. You can help them leverage what's important in them, in their communities, in their um, sense of pride. And we know that that's going to make a difference for um, healthcare as well. Okay, so you might notice that I'm wearing um, a Black Lives Matter t-shirt, and I just want to say a few words about um, our intention with that. Uh, I'm a white, I identify as a white person and I work, um, CSHA is a predominantly uh, white organization. And we know it's easy to hang a slogan on and that can be just an exercise in optical allyship um, and not have any real action behind it. Um, and that does happen and I've been guilty of that. And at the same time, I know that um, I and others need as many reminders as possible about this belief and this value statement. So I'm wearing this shirt as a commitment and a reminder to myself on both a personal and a work level, and also an indicator to Black people in my world um, that I want myself and CSHA to be a better ally and a better ancestor. And I want our organ, and I know we have a long way to go, a long way to go, and I want to hold us accountable. I want us all to hold ourselves accountable to this work and to really honoring the statement. So my hope is if I wear this shirt, I will be less likely to commit microaggressions against people, against Black, Indigenous, and people of color, and less likely to contribute to those social toxicities, toxicities that we talked about. And I hope that I will, and others will lean into um, connection, authentic listening, being vulnerable, and taking risks, as are so many of our speakers suggested as a path to healing transformation and recovery. I know that all of this is a lot harder than wearing, wearing a t-shirt. And I also know because I heard it from our speakers that none of us can be truly well until all of us are truly well. So now I want to share some optimism about school health and school-based health centers. This is the sort of state of the state portion of the talk. We all know that however great are, they are, school-based health centers can't do it all especially on the shoestring budgets they operate on and the need to produce that billable revenue to support those operations. 
We know this tension, it's been around forever. But this year, we are really optimistic because those of us here in this room and at this conference, we're not the only ones seeing the trauma, the disparities, the learning loss, the mental health crisis, and the immense gaps between what is and what should be for California youth. The need that you're experiencing on the ground, perhaps for the first time, at least in a long, long time, a critical mass of state and federal policymakers are recognizing it and investing in it in ways to address these problems. So I'm sure most of you know, Governor Newsom and the California legislature have announced some really significant one-time investments in child and youth behavioral health, school mental health, medical managed care, community schools, and social emotional learning, all really important um, areas. The state is also planning to transform the Medi-Cal program in ways that better support people experiencing homelessness, those with mental illness and substance abuse, people with chronic illness, social determinants of health, and other groups and populations in ways that might not seem to directly imp impact children, but we think will indirectly support their families and hopefully their communities as well. And for the first time ever, the, uh, both the US House and Senate have allocated federal funding for school-based health centers. This is a really big deal. Um, it's in the budget language. Uh, at this point, we don't know if Congress is going to actually pass a budget this fiscal year. Um, uh, the other option would be just having a continuing resolution, which would not include this language. But um, we really think if the odds are strong to have federal money for school-based health centers. So um, regardless of whether that's the final outcome, this represents a, some big gains on the federal level about the recognition and value of school-based health centers um, for the country's youth. And it sets us up for future years. So I'm excited and I want to thank and recognize our National School-Based Health Alliance and also other state alliances for all their hard work on this. And you, our partners, for um, their part. So we know school-based health centers are a great model of care that deserve these investments and more, and that only with your help and the help of others can we have a school-based health center in every school that needs one. Okay, I also want to say a little bit about what we at CSHA have been up to over this past year. Um, I've told a lot of people that I felt privileged to work from home. Um, and I also felt really sad because I no longer worked at a community health center that was sitting at the um, forefront of the COVID epidemic. Um, and I know many of you have been operating in that space and it's exhausting hard work. Um, so I thank you um, for, for that work. But I think a lot of us missed, to be, missed the chance to being a part of something um, bigger and helping to alleviate all the suffering and inequality. Um, so we're trying to be accountable to you, our field, with what we can do. We can't give vaccines and teach classes, um, but we have been doing what we can. So those of you who heard me speak at last year's conference closing may remember that our new strategic plan includes a commitment to nearly double the number of school-based health centers in California by the year 2030. We are now actively working toward this goal. We're reaching out to new audiences. Hopefully some of you are here today. Um, we have our new uh, messages about the model, and we're really seeking to um, work with communities where we can help bring partners together to achieve that goal. We held two virtual advocacy events where youth and adult advocates had a chance to meet with legislators to promote awareness, funding, and support for school-based health centers, and also to cultivate legislative champions. We've also been making our resources easier to get for anyone who's interested in expanding or improving school health. All of our resources are now available to anyone, not just members. And that includes our vision to reality step-by-step -step manual for starting a school-based health center. So I do wanna acknowledge that this guide is pretty outdated. We are working on a, a new version um, and you can watch for that or, or let us know if you wanna be um, contacted when it's uh, complete. And also, as we seek to sprout new school-based health centers across the state, we wanted to know more about where and how to best target our outreach. So we partnered with a graduate student, an amazing graduate student from the UC Berkeley uh, School of Public Policy, and um, worked with her to create a comprehensive student health index that spotlights where in the state these needs in health, education, 
mental health kind of sort of economics, um, where those needs are most acute for young people. Um, it is deficit based, but we think it's a good tool. Um, we hope you'll check it out and you can look up your own school or county or district on the index to see what challenges um, the, the data points up that your students are struggling from. And we plan to use this tool to pinpoint our outreach for new school-based health centers. It is why so many of you from the Central Valley and the Inland Empire are here this week. Um, and we know there's a lot of unmet needs on those regions, and we believe school-based health centers can be part of the solution to help address them. Um, in addition to all the work around growing school-based health centers, we're constantly trying to help existing school-based health centers do their work better and more sustainably. So, for example, we've been producing some new resources and guidance on school mental health. Um, on, our on our website now are a series of resources, including the following. Um, we have a student mental health implementation guide that LEAs and county partners can use as a resource for planning and funding school mental health services. I think there are links and pictures. Um, also, an online trauma-informed school-based health center guide that helps school-based health centers lead schools to become places where students can build resiliency in a safe and supportive environment that respects and responds to student experiences. So, so many of the things we've been hearing about over the past few days. We also just produced a behavioral health sustainability guide to show school-based health centers run by FQHCs, federally qualified health centers, how they can better build for and therefore fund more school mental health services. And finally, we're part of a statewide stakeholder group with managed care organizations and other partners on how to leverage the new MCO incentive program to support school mental health. So we hope these tools are helpful to you. Um, feel free to use them, share them, and then let us know what else you need to support and expand your school mental health services. Just a few more things I want to mention about our work at CSHA. Um, time check, okay. Um, last spring with our friends at West Ed, we co-hosted a 1,000 person virtual gathering on suicide prevention and response in the Central Valley. This was a really phenomenal event. I know some of the same speakers were here today. Um, super important right now, given what um, so many young people are struggling with. Um, in the same vein, we recently launched a pretty great learning collaborative for school-based health center behavioral health um, providers who are diving deep into how to use trauma-informed practices um, and social and emotional learning with an equity and racial justice lens and to address loneliness and depression. Um, we hosted a really great interactive training series on peer mentoring, and the sites who participated in that walked away with a plan to implement peer mental health training at their school sites. So probably most of you know that the concept of peer providers and really leveraging those with lived experience is gaining so much momentum and steam. So um, again, let us know how we can help you implement those programs. So I think the final thing I want to say about what we've been up to is, um, you know, this conference has reflected a lot of strong youth voices and I've been really pleased to see that. I'm sure you are as well. And so many of our speakers talked about the importance of genuine youth engagement, choice, and self-determination, especially during these periods of crisis and disruption. So we face this at CSHA too. You know, how can we truly honor youth voice and agency and power? We have this amazing youth board made up of super smart, super passionate young adults who have lived experience, who have wisdom and insight that we want to learn from, and we haven't always centered them in our organizational decisions. We're not great at that. Um, so I want to thank our youth board um, for patiently, mostly patiently, helping us begin to make some really small changes at CSHA, knowing that we, like many institutions, are a work in progress. And for us, one of the outcomes of this, this intention to um, center youth voice more was our policy statement on police and schools. So frankly, we couldn't or wouldn't have come to the position we ultimately did without the courageous leadership of our youth board. Um, they, helped, they helped lead us and um, didn't accept no for an answer and I think that was the right move. So um, 
Beyond that statement, youth leadership and engagement are also at the heart of our recent guidance on student tobacco and substance use and how it intersects with school discipline, as well as ideas for alternatives to suspension or discipline that schools can use um, when they are managing these kind of infractions on their policies. So we have two resources we're posting that we hope you will use as a launching point for creating and modifying your school policies so they support health, wellness, healing, and equity. Um, and just like uh, Centering Youth Voice at CSHA is a work in progress, we encourage all of you to continue working on this by listening to young people, valuing them as partners, and not just clients or patients or students, bringing them into leadership, and making them authentically as much a part of the process and solutions as you can. Okay, um, so in striving to help school-based health centers thrive and also um, start and expand more school-based health centers, we are focusing our next set of efforts on the Inland Empire. Yay! Um, many of you have joined us here today from San Bernardino and Riverside counties. So glad to see you. Um, and that's thanks to the generous support of our funding partner, Kaiser Permanente. Thank you, Kaiser. Kaiser shares our vision for more school-based health centers in your region. So I'm excited to announce that we will not be taking a very long break until we convene again um, in April 2022 for an in-person conference at the University of Redlands just outside San Bernardino. Please save the date. Uh, we will have a welcome reception on the evening of Thursday, April 28th, and our conference day will be on Friday, uh, April 29th. So this is a concentrated one-day event, and it'll be focused on the kinds of skill building trainings that are harder to do on Zoom, although it you know, seems like a lot of things are hard to do on Zoom. Um, and we're very excited that Anthem Blue Cross will be joining us as our presenting sponsor for this event. Thank you, Anthem. And with that, we are winding to a true close. I want to thank all of our presenters and participants for generously sharing your wisdom and your insights and your truths, for helping us build bridges and for resilience for youth and your communities. I wanna thank our master MCs, DJ Sat Jazzy Surge and the Fresh Lance. What an amazing team, could not ask for better MCs. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I wanna thank our sponsors, Kaiser Permanente, Anthem Blue Cross, Blue Shield of California, the California Healthcare Foundation, Valley Children's Hospital, the Los Angeles Trust for Children's Health, the Inland Empire, the Inland Empire Health Plan, LA Care Health Plan, the California Wellness Foundation, and the California Children's Trust. Thank you to our virtual exhibitors, many of whom are nonprofit friends and wonderful agencies in the school health space. We hope you find the products and services they offer can help you strengthen your impact. Thanks to our amazing partners at Rel West at West Ed, who made, helped make this event possible, and especially our tremendous keynote speakers. Um, they made that possible. Thank you. And thanks also to our volunteers from the LA Trust for Children's Health and Rel West, who helped us moderate all of these amazing breakout sessions. Thank you. An amazing Immense thanks to our CSHA family, our staff, our board of directors, our youth board, our volunteers, interns, and contractors. You know, I'm not gonna name names. This is a humble group, um, but it's such an honor and a privilege to work with all of you. Um, and it was a hard conference. There was a lot of stuff to make this hard, so thank you. And finally, thanks to you, our members, our attendees, our participants in our field. Um, for your work and connections to California youth and doing this critically important work at one of the most important times and one of, one of the most difficult times, I think, in our state's history. Thank you for coming. Thank you for participating. Please take care of yourselves. And I will invoke Lance McGee one more time to say, may you, your families, the youth and families that you serve, your neighbors, communities are climate and our planet be peaceful, healthy, and happy. And so it is. Thank you.
the end.